Okay, I'm going to start with uh, talking about various thermal analysis. Um, this is a bunch of thermal analysis equipment. Of this um, group, we have four pieces of equipment. We have the TGA, the TMA, the DMA, and the TGA. And they are the powerhouse um, thermal analysis equipment that uh, do just it. <laughs> um, this is on the DSC first. What is the DSC? Um, first of all, it is a calorimeter that measures the heat in and out of the sample. It's a differential calorimeter, so it measures the heat of the sample relative to a reference. And so a DSC is all of the above, plus it does uh, heats the sample with a linear thermal ramp. And these measurements uh, can be done quantitatively, or quantitatively and um, you can do, it tells you processes about the endothermic and exothermic processes. So just to tell you, endothermic on our machine is heat flows into the sample, and that's a downward trend on our machine. And exothermic heat flows out of the sample, which is an upwards. Kirkin Elmer does it opposite, but anyway, on uh, TA instruments, that's the way uh, it's set up. Here's some different uh, transitions. The first one here, that's a glass transition. That is an endothermic, it's going down. It's a reversible phase. So if you heat it, cool it, and reheat it again, it's going to be there. Crystallinity is also reversible. This is an exotherm. When the sample is melted and it um, has, is cooling down, it recrystallizes. So it gives off its heat, and that's an exotherm. Melting is an endothermic. Uh, Cross-linking is an exothermic. Um, that would be like if you want to cross-link um, polyurethane or uh, epoxy or something. It's going to give off heat. Um, the DSC that we use, you have to have, it has to be able to heat cure. If it's a water cure, you won't see anything on the DSC. But if it's a heat cure, once you heat it and get to this point, if you come all the way back and go up again, there would be a flat line. So it's a non-reversible phase. And here's oxidation and decomposition. And they are also an uh, What our DSC can tell you, glass transitions, melting and boiling point, crystallization, time and temperature, Heat diffusion reactions, specific heat, oxidation, thermal stability, rate and degree of cure, reaction kinetic security. Those are all things you can find out with the DSC. Here's a cross section of the block. This is where the reference pan, that's where it sits. Here's a sample pan. You have a Constantine disc that runs underneath the entire platform. <coughs> you have chromel wafers that come up underneath here. Um, one thing to remember too, when you're um, filling this pan up with sample, you want this pan also to weigh about the same. What that saves you is when you have a startup spike, you'll get a large startup spike if the samples are equal. So with this pan, you just take DSC pans and cut them, cut the bottoms off, and then stick them inside of the DSC pan to weigh approximately the same as this, and you won't get a very large startup hook. Sometimes that startup almost looks like a transition. Um, how the heat flux is measured. Heat flows through that chromel wafer causes a temperature difference. The temperature difference is measured with voltage. The voltage is adjusted through the thermal couple response and is proportional to heat flow. These are some of the signals that you can do. Uh, you can do it with your experiment in time. So you can tell it to sit at a temperature for an hour. And you can watch what happens over that hour. You can Program it up and watch it in temperature. So you're going to program 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees a minute and watch what happens. Or you can do it as heat flow. So you can watch the joules per gram change. Um, if you want to watch a signal change, and then the properties are on the right hand side. So this is the signal change, and here's the properties. So if you want to run a heat flow absolute, you'll get a specific heat measurement. Heat flow <coughs> shift, you get a glass transition. Exothermic peaks, you get crystallization or cure. Endothermic peaks is a melting, and isothermal onsets is oxidation stability. Some uh, definitions, you always need definitions. Amorphous is material whose molecules are randomly orientated in space. This would be something like a glass transition, which is what you're going to be looking for when you look at an amorphous region. Semicrystalline is the portion whose molecules are regularly arranged. Um, and that would be like, polyethylene or polypropylene. It's 
for the milk. Some of my crisp ones, we got a little beach. We got a little crystalline and a little amorphous material. Melting is the endothermic transition upon heating from the crystalline solid to the liquid state. And crystallization is the opposite. It's an exothermic transition upon cooling from the liquid state to the crystalline state. And I got a few more. Cold crystallization. This is kind of, um, you don't see this very often. It is, if you take, um, you're heating from the amorphous rubbery state to the crystalline state, and somebody very rapidly quenches a sample, and uh, you get a highly amorphous state. And what happens, this is in the heating curve, you get a cold crystallization. The sample has to melt, this cold crystallization has to uh, get some heat off before the actual melt can happen. I've seen this on polyester, they do it quite often. And enthalpy is um, the heat energy required for melting or the release upon crystallization. This is calculated by integrating the area under the DSC. So the heat underneath the curve is called heat of heat, and that's a very important thing to remember. Here's some available segments. You can jump, you can go from 100 degrees to 120. Uh, equilibrate, you can start at an initial temperature, and when you see everything is um, moving at a steady state, you can tell it to continue, you can ramp. Isothermal, um, it's using the furnace thermal cup to hold oven at a specific temperature, um, and isotracking is the sample thermal bubble. This one right here is very hard on your instrument. Um, your cell really has to put out to keep this one going for the long term. I don't recommend this one. Um, I usually go with isothermal. There's some more <coughs> events. Um, you can select gases. We have uh, helium, air, and nitrogen. Data storage is good if you want to run a sample in equilibrium and you don't want to see what it does in equilibrium, you just want to see what it does in the ramp, you turn it off, the data storage, and then turn it back on. Air cool, uh, probably at the end of the run, you can air cool, and then mark it in the cycles. So if you keep cool and reheat, you want to know where those cycles are at the ends of them. Um, this is for like for melts. If you want to run a integrated area over the top of a peak. You want to have at least two degrees, two minutes prior to uh, a stabilization period, prior to the transition, and you want two minutes after. And what you want that for is so that when you're doing a integration, your baseline is flat before and your baseline is flat on the way out, so that you can draw that baseline and have it nice and level. Um, this is different pans. We have aluminum, and they're great for everything except they melt at 600 degrees. Another consideration you have to know, if you have an internal cooler, you gotta know what temperature your internal cooler can go to. With our cooler on, we only can go to 400 degrees, so there's no way you gotta go to 600. We can take it off and then go up to 600, but it's just another consideration. Um, also, uh, we have hermetically sealed pans. Uh, with them, you can get about three atmospheres of pressure. If you need more than three atmospheres, you gotta go to a pressurized DSC. And then um, also for glass transition, you want about 10 to 20 milligrams of sample weight, and you want to heat it at 10 to 20 degrees a minute. For melting points, you want 2 to 10 milligrams of sample, and you want to run it at 5 to 10 degrees a minute. And for purity experiments, you want to run 1 to 3 milligrams and 0.5 to 